Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, great. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon with you, and I know you had some great talks this morning. I'm going to try and build on that, um, and uh, over the next uh, several minutes, half hour or so, try and be a little bit provocative, uh, if you will, in order to uh, get the juices flowing after lunch and uh, create uh, a forum for dialogue and some, hopefully, some great questions. But here are the ground rules. Um, <clears throat> it is after lunch, and so uh, normally someone would get up here and give a talk and uh, slide after slide, but uh, I want you to interrupt uh, if you uh, feel the need, if you have need to have a concept clarified or you want to uh, 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 challenge me on something, uh, that's the way it goes. There's no hard, uh, I mean, your job is to ask hard questions, and I, my job is never to be offended by it. Okay, so uh, let's get started uh, here. So what I'm going to try and do over the <clears throat> next uh, several minutes, if you will, uh, is to give you an overview of the historical underpinnings of the U.S. health system. How did we get here? Because that forms the basis for understanding the quantum change we need to make and, in fact, how, in fact, digital technologies uh, can help us make that uh, change. Uh, we're going to talk about the technology innovations disrupting traditional models of healthcare and how rapidly that path is accelerating right now. Uh, so it's not a question of if it's coming, it is already here. We may not, have, we may not fully appreciate it yet, uh, but we're seeing it in all of the dimensions of uh, our lives uh, uh, writ large, and it's now becoming more pervasive in uh, healthcare. I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of leadership in developing new enterprise goals to transform healthcare. Um, that in fact, we'll leverage these uh, digital technologies because without leadership, um, we'll never get to where we want to be. And then uh, for you as health communicators, uh, really, how are you going to shape that message? In fact, you probably are the most important people in this equation, in all of the stakeholders, because everything is predicated on how you communicate, uh, how you connect with others, how you make uh, the imperatives for change resonate, if you will, uh, with st different stakeholders. Uh, so I'm expecting a lot of you, if you will, okay? <clears throat> so I want you to take a moment to read this. Uh, I use this slide very often when I uh, give talks because it sets the stage for how important health is to a society and to an individual. And it says, when health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, and intelligence cannot be applied. Wow, that's a pretty profound statement. It means that being healthy as an individual and healthy as a nation or society is extraordinarily important to us uh, fulfilling our potential, becoming a progressive society, uh, and actually doing good. And if you've had the flu, uh, you know how you get sapped, your energy gets sapped, you just can't do anything. But on a societal scale, it is very important for us to understand the essential nature of creating a healthy society to creating a progressive uh, society. And, uh, and many of you have seen uh, sort of headlines like this before. This is a little dated. Uh, but it's about the issue of millions being uninsured um, and having no pathway to the health care they need, let alone the preventive measures of maintaining their health uh, that is very important. And so it's a really big problem for a lot of different reasons. Now, this slide uh, reflects uh, Michael Porter's uh, uh, conceptual framework of uh, how we should look at the expenditures and the value we get for the money we spend on uh, health care. Uh, I've modified it. I've taken a little liberty to modify it a little bit. Uh, his is really outcomes over cost as a conceptual framework, but I've added access. Uh, people have got to have access to care when is needed and access to information to preserve their health uh, when needed. But in this country, we spend $3 trillion uh, on health care, 18% uh, of GDP expected to be 20% uh, fairly soon. 
with estimations that about a third of it is wasted uh, because it's not evidence-based. Uh, it is not um, uh, given at the right time. Uh, it is not uh, effective in terms of uh, what uh, uh, is needed, uh, and we have overuse of uh, health care uh, resources uh, and technology and, and tests and the like. Only 50% of patients by some studies receive uh, the evidence-based care that should drive to the best outcomes. And we're ranked uh, far below other economically uh, developed countries in terms of our health outcomes in a number of parameters. At the height of the ACA, uh, when we had 20 to 30 million more uh, insured, we still had more uninsured in this country uh, than many other uh, economically developed nations, uh, both by percentage and by uh, actual numbers. And I know there's some debate now about the accuracy of uh, Senator Warren and Will Handler's uh, study about the impact of healthcare expenditures on creating personal bankruptcy, but it's really uh, not important about whether or not it's number one or number two. Uh, it has a significant impact on the personal solvency of individuals, uh, and that's problematic. Uh, when, in fact, uh, people go into debt because of health care, uh, do not receive adequate health care, uh, that becomes an important issue. And we have limited portability and interoperability of health data. We'll get into that uh, a little bit more. Uh, and for all that we do, um, we're not heading in the right direction in terms of uh, uh, preventing errors, making it a safe system. So this slide just uh, recaps some of that. We spend a lot as a percentage of GDP uh, and uh, per capita. This slide's a little old, but I think we're up to almost $10,000 per capita now. Uh, this uh, study came out in 2016 uh, from Johns Hopkins. Uh, you may remember in 2001, uh, the Institute of Medicine produced a a uh, study that said we had about 98,000 excess deaths due to medical errors. The repeat study says 251,000, clearly not going in the right direction. Even if you don't believe the absolute numbers, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, and we need to look at different ways of delivering care uh, and making it safe uh, as we go forward in the future. So the challenge is health care costs have grown uh, enormously in the past 50 years. The costs have consistently outpaced other segments of the, uh, um, of, of, uh, the society. Um, and as we look at the federal budget, um, it's really crowding out discretionary spending. Uh, so if you couple in defense and health care, uh, and then you add to that the, the service on the national debt, uh, we are shrinking and shrinking the amount of money we have for our infrastructure, education, and those other things that are very important in society. So we've got to re-engineer, reformulate to create some efficiencies uh, and produce uh, those, <clears throat> those dollars and that revenue to do other things that are important in society. And health care costs are creating hardships at a personal level. We, we talked a little bit about that already. But the key issue also to remember is that we live in a global world. A business is global. And if we have to spend a lot on health care here, if our businesses have to spend a lot on health care and don't get the value out of it, they become less competitive on a world stage. So this is really important stuff that goes far beyond uh, just uh, uh, making sure that uh, individuals are, um, uh, have insurance. I got deeply involved in these issues when I ran the military health system uh, during the Obama administration when I was Assistant Secretary of Defense, where I was responsible for a very large health system of some 56 hospitals, 600 clinics, um, uh, 54 to $60 billion uh, budget, uh, depending on how you count it, um, uh, but uh, an educational system, a research and development system, a public health system. Uh, and trying to align all of the pieces to drive to the best outcome uh, required that the system be re-engineered. And so I took a lot of those lessons away. But also, we were dealing at the time with an increased need for care, 
um, because of the war injuries and the complexity of these war injuries that were challenging not only um, how we delivered care, a system of care, uh, creating a connected system of care, but new issues that related to mental health uh, and trying to close the gap in knowledge about how to restore uh, ability, uh, physical ability and otherwise uh, to uh, wounded uh, warriors. And then on top of that, there were all sorts of new emerging issues that would impact and have to be adjusted for as we were delivering care. So the Ebola or the Zika, um, there's always something new. And that's true in society uh, at large. <clears throat> and this was the sort of economic imperative. Uh, I told you that my budget was about 54 to $60 billion. Um, the Budget Control Act had come in, so it was capping the top line of the Department of Defense. Healthcare was rising, and it was eating up all of the money and resources that it was going to take to man, equip, modernize uh, uh, the force. That became a national defense issue. Health now became a primary national defense uh, issue. And so it's this parallel um, of set of urgencies that I saw in this uh, subsystem, if you will, that really is important to society at, at large. But the real issue is that you can go anywhere in the world, and I, I have traveled around the world quite a bit, and every nation is, de is dealing with the same what we call iron triang triangle. That is the issue of in creating greater access, providing care for larger numbers of individuals, improving the quality and the outcomes, and creating sustainable systems. Uh, and it's a challenge. Now, what is interesting in different parts of the world, because they may be less developed and cannot and should not replicate what we do here, uh, they're experimenting at a much higher rate of leveraging technology to uh, develop health systems that provide greater access to care. And maybe we, we can talk about that in just, in just a moment. But every nation in the world is dealing with the same problem, and it'll be very interesting over the next decade um, as different answers come up uh, leveraging the technology base. So if we were to ask ourselves, really, what is it we want to accomplish? Uh, and this is taken directly from the Institute of Medicine. Uh, it's about developing a safe system that does no harm, really, so that 251,000 um, excess deaths due to the care we deliver uh, should be wiped away. We want an effective system so that, in fact, we are delivering the best evidence-based medicine to everyone, irrespective of where they're at or which practitioner is delivering that care or which system is delivering that care. Uh, we want a system that, in fact, uh, is efficient, uh, both in terms of financial resources but also human resources. One of the big issues that we're dealing with today because of the uncoordinated coordinated way um, the uh, system is being disrupted is provider burnout. Uh, the issue of the numbers of uh, physicians and advanced practice providers who are getting out of direct patient care is really startling, uh, in part because, again, uh, even technology that should be a benefit that has been introduced into the system hasn't been coordinated in the workflow so that it actually adds to the burden of what providers need to, needs to do, need to do, rather than solves uh, some of the issues. We want uh, certainly a patient-centered. How do we empower and engage patients? Uh, and we have that possibility with technology, and we'll bring that out in just a, a second. We want it to be equitable, meaning that if you need care, you can get it, irrespective of who you are, where you are. Uh, we, uh, being able to bring uh, sophisticated care if you're in a rural area um, versus an urban area, it should not be any different. And we want a high-performing uh, system so that we rapidly close gaps in terms of our knowledge base about what works, what doesn't work, uh, and we want to connect it, meaning that, in fact, uh, the issues relative to patient care are connected across the continuum. And I'll give you an insight uh, into what we're thinking about going forward um, as we roll out digital technologies, as digital technologies are available, the home really will become the first level of care. Uh, if you think about the Internet of Things, or like I like to say, the Internet of Medical Things, 
Um, there are ways of monitoring patients in their home, uh, and, and if we have the right connected systems, uh, a lot of care can be delivered at that level, and we can actually do a better job in terms of dealing with chronic disease. So we can prevent people from coming back to the hospital or needing hospitalization if we know what's going on in their home and we can deliver care. How many of you have an Echo Dot or an Alexa? Okay, isn't that the kind of the, it's a fun thing, right? You can ask it about anything. You, you make it play the music that you like, you know. It could remind you to set the timer when you're, when you're cooking. Well, think about it if there was an Alexa for healthcare. Uh, a family member of mine was recently in the hospital, um, uh, very ill at uh, one point, got better, was going home, and the nurse uh, came in and um, w was really great, uh, and, but just started on this litany of things that, in fact, uh, she needed to do when she went home. She wasn't able to absorb any of that. I, I mean, you know, it was, it was good I was there and I'm familiar with these things, but for the average patient, uh, Forget it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was an Alexa at home that could remind and refresh uh, and connect uh, for advice uh, to improve the quality of that post-operative care, to prevent that complication because they forgot to take the medicine or treat the wound um, accurately uh, and then needed to be readmitted. This is part of the vision of the future that you know, we'll embellish as uh, we, we go along. So you have to ask yourself, that's kind of the history. Well, why no change? Well, it's complicated in healthcare, and I'm going to spend a, just a few minutes looking at the history so we can unpack that and understand um, how we can drive to that uh, future state that we all desire. There's been limited acknowledgement of the complexity of the issues, and the stakeholders have been stovepiped so that they uh, address simple solutions, band-aids, if you will, that don't are not comprehensive enough. This leads to fragmented problem solving, and the technological solutions occur without an understanding of the human dimension and how, in fact, they should be integrated into health systems or how health systems should be changed to use the technology so that you actually get the benefit from the technology. And this is the thinking we've got to change. We've got to form new ecosystems, interconnected interdisciplinary groups that brings the comprehensiveness about how do we engineer and redesign these systems in order to leverage the technology and get the results we want. If you look back, uh, there was this interesting treatise written by Jill Quadrango back in 2005 uh, at the run-up to the ACA uh, looking at uh, why we don't have universal health insurance. She titled the, the book actually One Nation Uninsured. But it really explains how we got there. And I, it's a wonderful book to read if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, but I'm going to just take a couple of highlights. So first of all, in the 20th century, right, uh, particularly the early part of the 20th century, physicians were at the peak of sort of the educational ladder. Uh, and uh, they controlled the information. They produced the information relatively to, relative to health and health care. They uh, limited regulation, uh, they defined the standards, uh, they priced the information, right? Fast forward to the 21st century, of course, um, it's all about information and information flow, and so that situation no longer exists. That's in part why we're experiencing the, the burnout. I give another lecture on the issue of the, the loss of physician autonomy in, the, in sort of the digital age, but uh, suffice it to say, if you no longer control those things, you feel out of control, and that's part of the issue of the burnout. But there are other things like the employer-based insurance. It really is a product of World War II when wages couldn't rise because they were frozen and healthcare costs, uh, the, that is the cost of delivering healthcare, was very low because we weren't using a lot of technology. So companies offered healthcare as a benefit to entice people to come and work. You fast forward to the 21st century, of course, you ask yourself, why does that exist? particularly for the reasons I talked about before where, in fact, in a global economy, it's a negative competitive edge. Why do we have em employer-based insurance? Medicare, for example, one of the reasons Medicare was passed in the 1960s was, in fact, that we were beginning to use technology and, the, and uh, older citizens, of course, were more costly to insure and the insurance companies were too ready to let the government take over uh, the, the cost 
cost of their care. Think about now where we stand now where the costs are really high and the insurance companies are trying to figure out what their margin is basically. Um, that's why we got enthusiasm for uh, the ACA and expansion of Medicaid uh, sorts of, uh, of products. Policy decisions in government have also created interesting dynamics. So in the mid, particularly mid 20th century, uh, what happened is that they decided to uh, um, uh, resource, uh, uh, resource medical innovations and, and, and technology, but they decided to stay out of pharma. They said the government would not get into uh, producing pharmaceuticals, and that created a dynamic where you had an industry with a profit motive incentive, and I'm not saying that it was necessarily malicious uh, or, or malignant, but a profit motive incentive that was different than that w which was focused on an efficient healthcare system. So all of these things were misaligned. This article by uh, Woodlander, uh, Woodhandler and uh, Himmelstein uh, was done back, I think, in 2003 or so. Um, and basically they looked at, well, how much do we really uh, support in taxpayer uh, um, insurance, if you will? And really, they came away with a startling number that nearly 60% at that time uh, was supported by uh, our taxes, uh, which was more than a lot of other economically um, developed uh, countries. So they titled this article, Paying for National Health Insurance and, and, and Not Getting It. And the real reason was that uh, most of the time when we add up who the cost of who's paying for insurance, we look at who wrote the check to who wrote the check to the provider, if you will. But the truth of the matter is that every city employee, every state employee, every member of the armed services um, uh, really are supported by the tax base, right? Okay, and then if you add to that tax subsidies uh, and other kinds of um, uh, uh, tax rebates that are given, you wind up with the 60%. Now that was done 12, 13 years ago, and they repeated it, and of course, after the ACA, it's higher. So the question in our mind is that, you know, when you look at that value equation again, what value for the dollar is we're spending, you have to ask yourself, hmm, could we do this better? Could we cut out a lot of administrative costs? Could we, in fact, design a system that was much more efficient and created access for a lot more people at a lower cost by just, in fact, re-engineering a few things? And that says it in numbers. So healthcare is complicated. It's like a Gordian knot of uh, economic, uh, historical regulations, uh, politics, culture, and technological and professional issues that have been wound up to give us what we've got. And we've got to unpack that uh, in order to re-engineer the system and look forward to the future. And one of my favorite uh, folks to go to for uh, quotes is uh, Edward Deming, the guru of quality improvement, and he said every system is perfectly designed to get the results to get it gets. So if you design or you don't design a system, you just let separate stakeholder groups grow up, you get this complicated, disconnected, inefficient system that just begs for re-engineering and alignment of uh, the microsystems. And of course, a system, as he says, is a network of interdependent components or microsystems, if you will, that accomplish the aim of the broad system. And absent that, you, you don't have accomplishment of that, that aim. Uh, so if you look at what we've got here, uh, basically, and you don't need to read this if you can, this is what we've got. We've got pharmaceutical companies and hospital groups and health plans and physician organization and all sorts of separate sort of regulations and systems and policies that don't work in coordination to deliver an effective and efficient, patient-centered, equitable health system. And it needs to be rethought. And of course, you've got to influence policymakers because if you don't consider development of smart policy, you cannot al align the incentives. And that is uh, part of uh, the equation. So from my experience in Washington, uh, trying to align the incentives or influence policymakers required that you understood, understand where they were coming from. And so I would go up to the Hill all the time and I'd have to talk to uh, senators and congressmen about uh, issues related to, to health. 
uh, because although my mission was about the Department of Defense, because we were such a big entity, I got pulled into many of the other issues uh, relative to the ACA or the uh, VA or whatever else might be gone on that uh, senators and congressmen were thinking about. Now, we would, want, we would think that in a health, um, a kind of scientifically based uh, uh, medical system, science would dictate what the policy would be. Well, that's not the case, in part because we know there are gaps in our knowledge, and as a result, as practitioners, we actually do the art of the practice, which is based on the science, but creates a great deal of variability because we don't have, there are many things that are unknown. And that's why if you go around the country, in fact, there's a wide variability in the application of many tests and procedures. And then there are, of course, the economic issues uh, and the optics and the politics. So if you take stem cells, you can understand how it gets politicized, even if you could uh, dissect out uh, and be clear about the, the actual uh, science of, of what's going on. And then there's this big red ring, which is emotion. They're coming at it because they're charged, because their constituencies are charged. And as a result, um, you need to unpack these when you talk about developing smart policy and understand where they're coming from and try and bring them back down, if you will, uh, to those center rings. So if we come to the 21st century, one of the things we know is that uh, data is everywhere. Uh, but we've got to learn to fly by the instruments. How do we create knowledge and wisdom and the tools and instruments that should guide practice uh, so that we get the best evidence-based practice uh, every time uh, that it's needed and we don't get the same degree of variability? How do we leverage the investments that are being made in other segments of society relative to digital technologies and bring them into medicine uh, for benefit, such as machine learning? Uh, how do we adequately use these digital technologies and introduce them into the workflow so that they actually augment human capability, not distract from what humans need to do. And how do we move into the area of big data analysis uh, and informatics uh, or, or information um, at the point of operation uh, where the questions are being asked and we need answers? How do we create the robust decision support. So this little cartoon just shows that data influences everything, you know, health systems, design, leaders, policy, population, biotech. And traditionally we've used it and we've created incremental or maybe progressive change or even adaptive changes, let's say if a law changes, uh, you know, if the, let's say the or regulation, the Joint Commission decides that we need to do quality work, then we, we gather data on certain aspects of quality. But we really are now entering a, a phase in which data and digital systems are disrupting just about everything we do and how we think about it. Back in March, I wrote this article. Um, it's really an op-ed, if you will, and uh, the original title was Flying by Instruments in, in Healthcare. And I borrowed on uh, my experience years ago when I was a flight surgeon. And as a flight surgeon, you are trained in human factors uh, and um, failure modes analysis. Um, and if you go out to a plane crash, you know, you dissect out why and the wherefore. And what you find is that if pilots don't trust and follow their instruments, bad things happen. So probably the reason John F. Kennedy Jr. died is uh, this phenomenon that he was flying over water at night. and if the human perception is that if you follow the horizon, um, you actually wind up decreasing your altitude until you get to that critical point where you realize you're too low and it's too late and you fly right into the water. The new F-35 plane, which I'm sure most of you know nothing about, uh, costs the government a lot of money uh, and is now being deployed throughout the services and throughout the world to, to some extent. But it is so sophisticated that the helmet alone is almost a million dollars. And it's a heads up display uh, in which all of the digital and computer systems are displayed on, on the helmet. The point I'm making about this is that if the pilot doesn't trust their instrument, they will crash on takeoff. Well, healthcare is becoming like that. We are so technologically dependent, there are so many procedures 
Uh, we've gone to minimally invasive, which produces a lot of more, more technology, the testing, the imaging, that we no longer can rely on what's between our ears as practitioners. We need cognitive supports in order to process that information. We need predictive analytics in order to tell us how to down-select to diagnoses. In medicine, of course, because the amount of knowledge has grown so much, we have become a mile deep, but an inch wide, and so the gaps between specialists are growing, and that's where patients fall. And so we need assists to bridge those gaps in a way that will allow for safe uh, patient care, exceptional uh, patient care by using evidence base uh, to drive to the best outcomes. And these are some of the technologies that are on board right now that are really disrupting the way we think about delivering care. Synthetic and nanobiology uh, and what that offers in uh, sort of tailored therapy or even uh, delivery of drugs uh, to specific areas so that you don't get the side effects of, uh, let's say, cancer agents um, is on our doorstep. Genomics and proteomics, uh, what your gene uh, will, should tell us about how you would react to a drug, we need to know. So if you think about the gold standard of how we create information, what we call uh, tier one, level one information in medicine today, it's what? The randomized controlled trial, right? But let's think about how archaic that really is. We take a study design where we restrict the number of people who can enter the study because they have to meet specific criteria. Then we test against that variable of that drug mm -hmm. And we find that, in fact, it has a 30% uh, positive reaction, and then we take that data and we apply it to everybody, right? Just as, so that your characteristics really are probably vastly different than the people who were enrolled in that study, but that's the gold standard against which we roll out new evidence. In the day of big data analytics, where we can process your information on a genomic and proteomic basis, it's going to look a lot different uh, in terms of what, in fact, um, you would respond to versus someone else. Also, the, the issue is that we'll be able to um, uh, ta uh, tailor a, a lot of the treatments uh, more specifically on a broader array of characteristics that are personalized to you. Uh, there are epigenetic factors, uh, there are values, your personal values about how aggressive you want to be in terms of certain care strategies that all need to be integrated in, into this. And so it's a, di it's a different world. Uh, someone mentioned 3D scanning. Uh, uh, that's opening up a whole new, um, perhaps, uh, tissue manufacturing option uh, for replacement of tissues. Anybody a dentist in here or connected to the dental school? 3D printing is really going to change the way, in fact, dentists need to be trained. Years ago, of course, they spent a lot of time crafting, um, uh, perfecting their techniques of making prosthetics and the like. 3D printing just takes that away. It takes all of that need away, and you can focus on other parts of, uh, of, of education. We mentioned a little bit about cognitive computing, this issue of uh, decision support at the point of care. Uh, you know, IBM Watson, of course, IBM has invested heavily in this area about using artificial intelligence, uh, um, neural networks, if you will, uh, to mine data, to learn, uh, to produce uh, cognitive assist uh, for physicians. Now, one of the issues is and I've talked with, with folks there, is there seems to be this caution about not advertising it as a replacement for physicians, and I don't think it ever will be. But what they clearly need to be more aggressive about, and what we clearly need to be more aggressive about, is understanding how we change professional development to allow the human-machine interface to be optimized so that we can fly by the instruments and we can use these kinds of technologies. It, the professional development looks radically different in a, in a digital age where you've got to uh, create a, mach a machine uh, human interface. Robotics. 
there's going to be, um, I think, a real um, explosion of the use of robotics for therapeutic reasons as well as perhaps uh, investigative reasons on a, on, a, on, a, on a micro level. But the whole idea of uh, creating exoskeletons uh, and robotic exoskeletons are, have the potential for allowing paralyzed uh, people to walk again. Uh, so lots of technology, but how do you integrate it into the system? Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality um, has the potential for changing the way we train um, and the way, in fact, uh, we teach and educate both patients uh, and providers. Um, think about the issue of how we train. Uh, it's an apprenticeship. I'm a surgeon. Um, I went to medical school and then I went to residency, which was really a, just a long apprenticeship where I worked with masters and they taught me how to do surgery. Well, the problem is we've changed so much the way we uh, do surgery nowadays. Um, there is the option through VR uh, and assisted reality and gaming to allow people to ramp up their skill set in the virtual environment before they actually go into the clinical environment uh, where they might do harm. Uh, it gets back to this issue of creating a, a safe uh, environment. So all of these things are here now. Just a, a word about this issue about augmenting and amplifying human performance. Uh, this was taken uh, from an article uh, uh, in an in a interesting publication, a new partnership uh, between uh, uh, humans and machines uh, from the healthcare nerd and digital strategist. That, that tells you things are changing, right? <laughs> but, but the point of this is, and I think this data is a little old, is if you look at those specialties and disciplines on the uh, left side of the screen, and you look at the uh, automated algorithms and then the human accuracy, you can see that, in fact, digital technologies in terms of pattern recognition and image reading um, are superior in a lot of cases. Uh, but there are other studies that say when you put the human and the machine together and optimize it, uh, it virtually doesn't fail. So think about that, what it means to you and your loved ones and what you expect of a system um, in the future, God forbid you have a serious illness. A couple things more. So. You know, we've tested, this, this is actually a study I, I um, actually financed when I was in, in government, and we were looking at the benefits of uh, telemedicine in behavioral health uh, 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 treatment strategies, care strategies. And what we found is that uh, it was pretty good, actually. Service members uh, receiving this uh, telemedicine um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, therapy uh, actually had uh, decreases in their PTSD symptoms and depressive symptoms um, by significant um, uh, numbers, if you will. And it was interesting to unpack a little bit of this. Uh, uh, just think about the issue if you have an anxiety disorder and you're going to see your counselor, uh, and in order to get to that counselor, you've got to get in your car, you've got to navigate traffic, on this congested highway, you got to try and find parking. You get, you're you're trying to get there on time, you know, uh, and then you've got to try and rapidly settle down so you can therapeutically engage. Think about the difference if you're sitting at home in your comfortable chair with your cup of coffee, uh, and you just turn on the um, video screen, the computer, and engage. So it may be as simple as that, if you will. But oh, by the way, the cost of delivering that care, a lot less. So uh, Kaiser Permanente has been exp uh, experimenting with uh, how to roll out digital technologies, improve their strategy and system of care. And uh, Haverson um, uh, and others uh, published out of a seminar they, ha they had, out, had out there, this issue of the digital is the fourth space in healthcare. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, this was actually, I think, in 2012 or so, but um, it really is coming to fruition. So when they talk about digital channel for health led by payers and providers, 
uh, we are seeing all new business, a lot of new business models that are actually developing. Has anyone heard about the CVS Aetna um, collaboration, right? The whole idea is uh, can we use data analytics and use the retail platform of all of these mini clinics to deliver uh, better, uh, more patient friendly primary care and capture 70% of the time primary care? Oh, and by the way, maybe we can also deliver better chronic disease management with using our, our data analytics. We've seen the uh, Berkshire Hathaway Amazon, which will look at customer facing platforms so that you can organize your personal data um, and interact with the healthcare system in a different way with deeper knowledge. This is patient engagement and empowerment, uh, if, if you will. We've seen um, uh, the Walmart Manor and uh, various others. So there are these disruptive models that are really here already that are challenging conventional ways we are delivering healthcare. And then, of course, we have digital innovation for the consumers. Again, this is, again, the Amazon, if you will, or the Google, if you will, with the personalized health record. Imagine the future state where you have a personalized longitudinal health record that not only has all of your data to include your genomics and your proteomics so that, in fact, you can tailor, but is interactive in a way that if you develop a new problem like rheumatoid arthritis, it can actually down-select literature for you to read or create a virtual link, uh, a link to a virtual reality state so that you can understand your disease better. And oh, by the way, because it's got all of your information, it might come out with an algorithm for the best treatment strategy. If you have that and you go into your provider, the nature of your interaction with your provider is going to be radically different. It's going to be turned on its head uh, in terms of the power and the value of that information um, and getting you to the best evidence-based therapy as soon as possible. This is the way we have got to change our thinking and you as communicators have got to begin to create the dynamics around this in terms of communicating what the potential is for the future. And of course, the digital initiatives for the social impact uh, by governments and uh, foundation across a broad area. So 60% of outcomes in health are due to social determinants of care, uh, social determinants of health. Only 40% are due to provider technology uh, direct interaction. So we've got to spend time there understanding how to influence uh, healthy populations where people live, work, and play and connect to those uh, communities. Uh, whoops. How do we, okay, I see. We have to turn it around, right? I see. So the issue is that dis digital disruption of healthcare is here. Um, and so we've come up with uh, uh, Pro Professor Venkatarama here at the business school to uh, conceptualize it through this digital health matrix. And it suggests that every industry is becoming digital. Incumbents must think about how they compete and collaborate with the digital giants to drive improvements. Every organization thinks about their, should be thinking about their future in the digital age. And organizations must break free of the traditional moment. So it's a, it's a change in mindset that uh, we really need to begin with. And we talk about sort of the three win winning moves uh, in this digital matrix, uh, in this digital matrix, if you will. It's about orchestrating and participating in new ecosystems. So the partners don't look the same, CVS and Aetna, Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon. Who should be the partners uh, if we truly understand that 60% of the outcome of health are the social determinants of health? We have to create these new ecosystems and we need to leverage the digital technologies. And that means we have to co-create new capabilities with these partners, telemedicine, if you will, personalized uh, health records, if you will. And then we need to amplify the human talent with powerful machines, that human uh, machine interface. We need to nurture that. So <clears throat> as mentioned, digital health is now a defined thing by many organizations to include the World Health Organization. You can read that uh, definition there, but it clearly is multidisciplinary. It engages patients and, uh, and, and customers. It's meant to amplify and augment human uh, capabilities and be able to create more efficient uh, 
uh, clinical care and administrative process. And on the right side of that slide are all the things, uh, or I should say some of the components that it represents from precision medicine to wearables uh, to mHealth, et cetera. So as I sum up here, the issue is uh, we've got wicked problems in healthcare. But we need to embrace those wicked problems because it's going to extend outside of the authority line of any one existing domain today. And we need to develop these new partnerships. And we need not shoot for, uh, we should not be shooting for simple solutions because simple solutions will not, in fact, work. It actually will complicate the issues. And we need to not necessarily look for the formal networks, but we need to look for the informal networks that will drive uh, to um, uh, fruition uh, and drive to the solutions we need. And to do that, we need to deconstruct the problems, understand how, in fact, we got here, and begin to realign uh, those uh, microsystems, understand those microsystems, um, and exert uh, meta leadership. Uh, we need to communicate differently and more effectively. We need a new type of leadership that is dynamic, understands and embraces the complexity of the problem. We need to develop new curriculum and new interdependencies, if you will. And these are the skills that our 21st century leaders need, in fact. They need to, how to be able to create and stimulate interdisciplinary teams to think about new and comprehensive solutions, communicate, it's up there. Uh, change management, understand systems design, systems engineering, and embrace the technical advances uh, and how they can be leveraged. So what we've tried to do since our, we returned here to Boston University was embrace that complexity through the Institute for Health Systems Innovation and Policy. We work across five innovation and knowledge domains that expresses, in fact, uh, that complexity, but that's how we organize the work, even as they're interconnected and they have uh, uh, issues that uh, spill over, if you will, into the other uh, domain. But this is a way we feel we can accelerate um, our understanding of how to arrive at solutions uh, that are important to reforming our healthcare. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you very much for your attention, and uh, do I have time for a couple questions? <laughs> Question, yes. deal of information, but one thing I did not see mentioned that will uh, is capable of disrupting even on top of digitation is, is climate change. For example, if we lost 80% of our uh, hospital capacity through a sea level rise or through the collapse of the Ross Ice Shelf, mm -hmm. all of this, well, it would be changed. So. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to sort of build that into the well, system? Well, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you for the question. I, we had another forum, I think, last fall where we sort of addressed the uh, forces that would be shaping health and health care 2045, and uh, Jonathan Peck was there to lead us off at that time. But one of the issues we addressed was climate change. Flora and fauna is changing, of course. Uh, um, uh, the types of diseases we're seeing, uh, heat-related diseases, it, it may even affect, affect uh, sort of uh, um, how we, uh, our basic physiology as, uh, as humans. So there are many unknowns. I think the issue in the digital age, uh, what we can do is start uh, uh, sophisticated modeling about these factors uh, and then, you know, hopefully anticipate what we need to do to adjust to uh, climate change as well as prevent, um, you know, uh, progressive climate change. Yes. Um, Sarah Edwards, uh, alum. Um, I've had some coffee today, so I'm going to try to succinctly do this. You've mentioned a lot about, um, obviously, innovation, leadership, um, physician burnout, safe environments, do no harm. Um, I worked um, in a lot of health promotion programs prior to my life now, which is in academic medicine. So I'm surrounded by clinicians, MDs, doing curriculum development in a medical school. And I am sort of um, 
alarmed at our medical students and residents who just simply don't understand or have formal education because I see and design the formal education with MDs for simple preventive medicine measures, wellness, nutrition. I can tell you that I just came back from a conference with um, 600 medical science educators leading curriculum reform in medical schools and having nutrition as a piece of the curriculum or wellness is still so rare. Um, our students and physicians are dealing with burnout at uh, rates that they never have before and feel very uncomfortable trying to teach their own patients in primary care. So I just wondered if um, anyone in the room have thoughts on how we can uh, make a difference in that way because we have all these wonderful programs to teach our public about medical education, wellness, nutrition, those fundamentals, but we're really lacking with our own medical doctors. So I wonder what you thought about that. So I couldn't agree with you more, and again, I think that's why I alluded but didn't dwell on the issue of um, different strategies for professional development, but also, again, this issue of uh, helping to provide decision support at the point of care. Um, so there are ways not only to educate better uh, and more broadly, and again, that's why I pointed out the fact that because of the expansion of knowledge, the way we've reacted in uh, the discipline of medicine is to create more specialization and subspecialization. So we're a mile deep, but now <clears throat> we're not quite as wide. We don't have the breadth. I think the issue is that we need to de de redesign professional development um, so that uh, we create those competencies, but also give um, uh, have the ability to give uh, decision support at the point of care. Um, and I think those are the two ways of getting around it. Plus, the issue is about how do we work in teams? Um, do the physicians have to do everything, or do the, should they know how to leverage other members of the team to accomplish what should be the gold, which is the best education and outcome for the patient? So all of those are parts of the answer. Yeah. Yes. said, and that's what it's all about because they're all trained in dif different disciplines. And at Boston Medical Center, I pair my dietetic interns with medical students um, um, to teach the medical students the role of the registered dietitian in the interprofessional care team because, um, as I tell my uh, students, you're, um, you have to advocate for your, your patient, which is the diet part of it. So the, everybody needs to work together in interprofessional to get the patient as a whole. And preventative is key. When you look at the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, heart disease number one, cancer two, stroke four, and diabetes number seven are all can be fought with a knife and a fork. So we, we really need to get this all going together, um, as you already said. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Hello again. Uh, so in my role, I get the, the pleasure of working with a lot of the large health systems, like the CHI, Bon Secours, Trinity, Banner, you name it. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the future of healthcare leadership. And no matter who I work with, West Coast, uh, Southeast, North, Northeast, doesn't matter. The path towards the C-suite is very similar, where somebody gets their master's in healthcare administration, they do time at a smaller hospital, they move up the ranks. And if they don't perform as they become the CEO of a large hospital, they move to across the country and become the CEO of another hospital into like a really tight knit network of mm -hmm. folks that just kind of revolve around. Um, so, do you think the path towards uh, hospital leadership has to be where you have a distinct background in healthcare, or is there some other path that you think we might be more effective going forward? Because clearly, what we're doing is not working. So, is there some hybrid approach? What are your thoughts on the future of healthcare CEOs? So, there there are two parts to my answer. One is. Uh, uh, you should start to question as to whether or not the hospital is going to be the epicenter of care, which means that um, are the types of professionals that you have um, described somewhat of an endangered species, um, and, and I'm being necessarily provocative by saying that, but the issue is that uh, in a redesign of a truly effective uh, system, it's not a question of if we build it, they will come. 
uh, we will need to do distributed health care. And again, as I mentioned before, the home will be the first platform for that care. So the effective executive of the future is going to need to look beyond the walls of that hospital, and they're going to need different competencies than um, the ones and the process you've described for, for growing those folks. Um, uh, I, you know, I think the landscape is going to look different in, in the future. I think one of the things we're learning over the, the last couple of decades is that the pathway to the C-suite has become sort of this MHA, uh, MBA kind of uh, pathway only because um, uh, there's been such a lack of uh, leadership training in sort of the traditional um, health disciplines. You know, three decades ago, um, if you were a doc and you uh, were clinically superior, you got to be the department chair and then, you know, you got to be the CEO of the hospital or whatever. And, and we know that went away because we know that there were, there were many more skills and competencies needed to run uh, sort of hospitals and systems in, uh, uh, in, in the modern age. But I think even the folks who uh, we have groomed for the C-suite in the way they've been groomed for the C-suite uh, will need to change. Thank you for a terrific presentation. Uh, this morning, a couple of us were talking about uh, real-world evidence and how it will have a, a direct benefit for everyone in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. But could you talk about some of the obstacles or mindsets that can slow the adoption of innovative uh, technologies or, or approaches such as real-world evidence? Uh, so absolutely, the, the biggest obstacle, obstacle is the way we think and the way we've been trained, right? Uh, so it's pretty clear from, you know, uh, if you talk to people in business that um, incumbents uh, never radically change the way they do business. And that's why Kodak went out of business. That's why you don't see Blockbuster anymore because they were wedded to a certain business model and didn't see Netflix coming or the digital camera coming. Although, you know, the digital camera, camera was actually invented at Kodak but they were wedded to film photography uh, and they went out of business. So the issue really is, is don't look at the incumbents, look at the new entrants. It's really the Googles, the Amazons, uh, the Apples uh, that are going to disrupt what we do because they're not gonna play by the same rules. Uh, you know, if you, um, if you have Netflix, for example, um, after using it a couple of times, it learns what you like and it puts it out there. If you use Amazon, it learns what you like and you get an advertisement for uh, something similar almost immediately when you turn it on. Um, so they're not gonna play by the same rules, uh, basically. And so this is the part of the disruption. Uh, this is the part of the difference between using data for incremental and maybe slightly progressive and real disruption. What we're seeing now is there are other actors that normally haven't been in the health sector that are coming in and are thinking differently. And because our society, we're at this tipping point because because our society is so digitized, you know, uh, I won't ask how many in here have an iPhone and how you organize your life, but remember the iPhone was only introduced 11 years ago. And boy, has that changed? There have been, you know, what, uh, 10,000 apps that have uh, been developed. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so it, it, it's, it's the issues of what hap is happening in the rest of society and non incumbents uh, that's going to reorder the mindset. Yes? How are you going to decommercialize healthcare and take the business out of it? and make it, so if we look at data, some of the biggest influences in data have made it open source. Uh -huh. yeah, so like access to everyone, and uh -huh. think of it on a more global sense. Yeah. Is that possible? So I would challenge the premise of the thought a little bit just to be provocative. Maybe you don't want to take the business out of it. Maybe what you want to do uh, is get the benefits of the competitive edge of business and their ability to innovate because of that competitiveness into healthcare to drive change. 
Um, so one of the things is that we've become sort of complacent in healthcare. We have this strategy for uh, how we pay for healthcare, those three trillion dollars and how it goes. And so we, we sort of compete around the edge, but it's basically the same formula. But if you have, let's say, an Amazon or a Google comes in with a whole different model that empowers and engages patients and allows them to um, make decisions because it's customer patient friendly and uh, truly patient centric, but at maybe what, it's not a bad thing. But at what end? Hmm? At what end? Because at the end of the day, it's the data which is king, yeah? Yeah. And we've seen it through the Facebooks and all mm -hmm. the rest. There is a reason why these large companies have the volume and the, mm. the estimate that they have. They are not in it for the health and well-being of the patient, mm -hmm. they're in the health and well-being of their bottom dollar. Yeah, no, so you're absolutely right, and so there's an upside and there's a dark side, sure. right? Uh, and it's about policies, remember that yeah. other thing we talked about? Uh, how you, um, in fact, uh, um, craft those policies. So if you look at the issue of Cambridge Analytica, right? Okay, um, it's looked at being really kind of a dark side, right? But the truth of the matter is, in fact, uh, they just use data to tell you where to target, in fact, your ads. How to be efficient rather than throwing out the net to everyone, saying, sending the same ad to everybody. They could micro-target populations and send tellerized ads to that particular population. Now, on the one hand, it looks very manipulative, doesn't it? But on the other hand, if you're talking about sending personalized health information that really is going to improve your health outcome. And these are the things, these are the thorny things we're going to have to deal with. Uh, uh, what's the upside and what's the downside? So just one follow on from yeah. that. If we do make it more open source and more global so that we ask the large companies to come in and the academic partners and the rest of the mm -hmm. healthcare management teams, how do the regulators deal with that? How do they know exactly how they're going to because they have to think forward. Yeah. So how do we get to that point where we can say, okay, what should we be looking at to make sure that healthcare is looked after in the future? Yeah, so that's why, you know, um, when I was describing the model of the Institute and mentioned before, that we had to be thinking um, sort of ahead in terms of these policies. But one of the things I want you to also understand is that we tend to be very U.S. centric in how we think about these things. And in fact, the rest of the world is sort of moving ahead of us. If you look at China, for example, uh, uh, China had that big earthquake, uh, and in fact, it demolished their healthcare infrastructure. Uh, they didn't recreate that infrastructure. They created mobile health um, and used uh, digital technologies to deliver care to a much larger group of individuals at uh, reduced cost. In fact. China has embraced uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and really has an overt um, uh, sort of plan to be the world's leader uh, in this. I, the reason I bring this up is because we think that um, because we're the U.S. and for 100 years we have been developing um, uh, concepts and technology in health and then exporting it, that that's going to continue. In fact, what we're seeing is this concept of now reverse innovation where we've become so cumbersome, people are going overseas, particularly in uh, 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 sort of un, uh, uh, in developing nations where they can't afford to replicate, nor do they want to replicate what we've got, to see if digital platforms will help them create access for a broader swath of the population and elevate their care. So we're going to see things floating back from overseas. England, for example, right now um, has got a uh, big initiative to look at how they're going to leverage um, uh, sort of technologies to deliver, to create access, improve outcomes, and create sustainable systems. So while we may be resistant here, what we're going to find is that all around us, we're going to find the creeping in of digital technologies that are going to define, I think, better ways of, of doing things. And we may be importing from overseas new strategies. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Woodson. That was a wonderful, that was a wonderful talk, and I really appreciate that you opened up a conversation about uh, universal health care. And I would be very curious to hear your thoughts about where you think we're going with regards to universal health care or a single payer system, because in many regards, that seems to be the direction that things need to move in. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, thank you again for that question, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, so we know what uh, changes have occurred in the ACA over the present administration, and it's fraying the edges. There's no doubt about, uh, about that. Um, unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is things are going to get worse, uh, and then people are going to realize um, kind of what needs to be done. Hopefully, there'll be a groundswell. It's interesting that under uh, a year ago, when the proposals uh, were coming up about how to reform the ACA, uh, what was interesting, and I bet, I bet a lot of people didn't know this, is that there was a form of uh, single-payer insurance that had crept in under the guise of uh, uh, enrolling more, uh, changing the rules for eligibility for Medicare, expanding it, reducing the age, um, expanding uh, sort of the program for Medicare. And the issue is that if you look at the administrative cost of Medicare, it's about, what, 2 to 3%, whereas for other private insurers, it's about 16 to 21%, depending on how you, you, you look at it. Um, the point I'm making is that <coughs> it, it may be about how we phrase it, how we describe it, um, uh, how we uh, create the business model around it that will create momentum and resonate even with more conservative uh, folks. Um, and that's going to be our challenge because if we stick to polarizing terms, we don't get anywhere. But we've got to, again, be able to create the – your communicators – create the narrative around um, not only the, the imperatives for change but what it really means rather than st sticking to, I think, uh, polarizing descriptors. Yes. Am I running out of time here? Okay. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the All of Us research program, uh, or if you are yourself, but um, the NIH is trying to enroll one million people into a research study. So yes. can you speak to what kind of impact you think that will have? So that's a very good question, and it has, um, again, several implications. When I was in government, I actually served on a group that um, was looking at um, how to reform research, uh, but also President Obama, and I showed you that slide there, literally sitting across the table from him just like that, uh, he kind of pointed at all of us, poked all of us, and said, you've got to be thinking about how to do business uh, differently. So um, what he was trying to motivate us to do is to understand, again, we were moving into the information age, we had moved into the information age, the digital age, and how, in fact, we think about doing research should be different. So the whole idea about um, individuals submitting their own data, so get back to this concept of the longitudinal personalized record. Think about if you could put it in the cloud and then, in fact, researchers could access that from a billion people, if you will. It changes radically the nature of, of, of how we do research and what kinds of questions we ask and how we what kind of studies we actually finance and the value of that information uh, that we get out. So w I think President Obama, uh, in the, particularly in his last year, tried to set the stage uh, for reform of research. You know, we worked on the common rule, uh, but we also set uh, the priorities for the NIH that were different in terms of collaborative research, these broader data sets, and then the ability to have um, uh, individuals uh, put their information into a database. In the future, um, I think uh, crowdsourcing kinds of research are going to be as important, particularly for post-marketing of certain devices and drugs, as it is some of that pre-sort um, uh, of approval um, uh, sort of data that's collected. In fact, I think that's going to be a continuum, if you will, that's going to be necessary. So I think we're going to change the landscape of how we do research uh, in the digital age as much as uh, we use the data to, to drive the different patient care strategies and outcomes. Uh, Kathy Cranes, an alumni. Uh, I was really intrigued by your statement that uh, was on the slide that simple solutions often make it worse. I just wondered if you had a couple examples of what that might be. 
So, uh, I mean, there are a lot of examples, but the, the issue, I mean, just look at the electronic health record, right? Okay. Um, on the one hand, it looks like a great concept, but on what it was designed for, in fact, was to be an administrative support to healthcare, so billing, et cetera. It was also a way of archiving information, but in fact, it just complicated the workflow of practitioners. So there, I, I hear all the time about the issue of spending three hours now after clinic to just enter data um, and you know put the checks box in there. That is just one example. The way we, we should think about the technology is that we know that digital technologies at the beginning were about this administrative support. And then they moved into the issue of the possibility of innovation. So, um, you know, extracting data for quality improvement sounds good, but it's a lot of labor intensive work. And if you don't have good quality information going in, you're not going to get good information coming out. And so now what we're seeing is it's at the point where we understand what the possibilities of these digital technologies will be, and now it's disrupting. But mainly it's being disrupted because, again, these external um, actors, these folks and companies that not have been traditionally in the health sector, are challenging the way we do business um, with uh, sort of their digital technologies. But it's going to be painful as we go through this.